I'm going to talk to you about a problem that is bollocksing our ability to solve problems, and that is outrage. It comes by many names, and acrimony, anger, affront, self-righteousness, heard that word recently, and is it helpful? Where does it come from? Well, we have a lot of problems to solve. There's hunger in the world, there's poverty, decaying infrastructure, there's um, spreading deserts, and all sorts of problems regarding this, this bad clickers. <laughs> <laughs> Human waste swarming all over our planet, pollution, freedom is always under threat. And of course, we're changing the very atmosphere that we breathe, making the planet less habitable by us and our fellow species. After 70 years, the United States of America is starting to get used to the idea, after 70 years of an illusion that there's no such thing as class conflict, we're starting to resume what was the habit for 6,000 years of almost every other culture of conflict between the classes. And, of course, there's all the science fictional scenarios that might come true in which the heavens might rain down on us in various ways. Funny thing, that seems to have been the mythos in past civilizations, too. We have lots of worries, and there's lots to do. So does anger help? Well, indignation helps us to fight needed battles. And there are many battles that need fighting. The <laughs> just achieving justice, trying to do better, than all of the previous generations of our ancestors, whose most well-meaning members took for granted things that we find loathsome today. In order to fight these fights and all the other things that are needed in order to improve the world, yes, you betcha, anger can help. Passionate confrontation is important, but passion is not the only important thing. Your enemies, your foes, your adversaries are passionate too. The ones who are pushing things that you consider to be deadly to your de own descendants, your own children, and to the survival of the earth. They are passionate too. So the question is, is there something that we have that they don't? Do problems get solved? That's a fundamental thing. And I'm going to start down the path of discussing anger by making some of you extremely anger, angry. Because I'm going to talk about Something's getting better. And as you start feeling angry at me for saying that, watch your own emotion and wonder, why, do, why does good news make me angry? Well, Steven Pinker, professor at Harvard University, has published a book called uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature, which lays down a case that has been made across the last 20, 30 years, of something that is statistically obvious, and that is that many things are getting better uh, after a skyrocketing of democracy in the world in the 90s, the rate of increase in democracy and freedom in the world slowed down, but it's still increasing, unambiguously. The uh, rate of violence and bad clickers uh, <laughs> is, is uh, going down, especially in the United States. But crime is going down. The per capita rate of violence per person across the globe. You wouldn't think this because the media focuses on terrible things going on in the world and we don't stop to realize that it's because media centers on these bad things in the world that A, we have the impression that violence is going up and B, we focus our attention sometimes on it because of that. And as a result, every decade of the last um, 60, 70 years, since the nadir of human civilization in 1943, Actual per capita violence worldwide has been plummeting. Poverty has been going down. The never before has such a high fraction of children on this planet lived in a home with electricity, a refrigerator, school books, and going to school every day. In some parts of the world, poverty is declining very rapidly. In others, it's just started to tip over. But the real question I have to ask you is, why are some of you fuming right now? Why are you angry to hear this? We'll get back to that. 
We have taken on in just one generation so many bad habits that our ancestors took for granted. Even the good-natured ones, even the good people of the past took, to, took for granted assumptions about how race or gender would channel you your whole life because it limited what you could be. And we've taken on these habits, foul habits, to such a degree that they haven't vanished. They're still there. They're horrible problems, as we see all the time. But they're in ill repute. Today's racists, at least in the West, have to deny they're racists. I wanted you to go back to 30 years. If you would ask any science fiction novelist, any person of whatever political stripe to bet what fraction of the whales would be extinct by 2014, some of the optimists would have said only 20%, 40%. Some predicted they'd all be dead by now. Nobody would have predicted 0% with some of them coming back in a big way. Am I a Pollyanna by pointing out these things? Like, for instance, the amazing, the, what would have amazed anybody that if you had predicted it 30 years ago. Well, we have a planet that's in trouble. We have terrible problems to solve, and yet there is always the possibility that good things are happening, and they are. So what is the method by, that we use to solve problems? Well, most human civilizations were shaped like a pyramid with a few lords at the top, kings, priests, lording it over those below. And you know how problems got solved in those days. The greatest human talent is delusion, and my science fiction novels cater to that. And it's wonderful. It's the source of art, but it's also the sort of source of 6,000 years of horrible statecraft because the solution to problems was, I know how to solve it. You do it. We today have a diamond-shaped social structure. It's not as good as it should be ideally, but it's our ideal of a middle class, vast empowered middle class that is not dominated from above and that outnumbers the poor. And to the extent that we've accomplished this, it's a miracle. And to the extent we haven't lived up to it, it's a shame. But it calls for incredibly different problem-solving methods than just you do it. And that's why some people in our society are nostalgic for the just you do it solution to problems. Things would get done. Well, we get things done, but it requires bargaining and the development of the ability to negotiate in complex solutions. And a lot of people just don't like that. They prefer the old-fashioned concept of the zero-sum game, in which if I win a bit, you lose a bit. And in politics, it should be like that. We want to annihilate the other side. As opposed to what the diamond-shaped society preaches with its markets and its democracy and science and justice courts, all of which use competition. And when they work well, and I'm not saying they do, but when they work well, winners and losers Eh, the terms mean something differently. We all benefit from better products, better policies, better scientific theories that look up the positive sum game. But it all is involved in how we negotiate. Do we negotiate? Yes. It helps to give a little, take a little, prioritize what you want most, and maybe give away something that you want less in order to get it. And this is how we have gotten this civilization. Is it still working? Obviously not. Obviously, we are in a tsunami of this. We live in exciting and fearful times. Most of you today are not afraid of big crime or big business or big labor. Rather, most of us are most afraid of big government. And this. Anyway, Duke's website also explains Sotomayor's appointment was part of the vast Jewish conspiracy and even that nutbag trashed Boss Limbaugh, today's worst person in the world. Now, I have my own political opinions. I am able to turn my head left and right and see that anybody, any side of the spectrum, this lobotomizing, silly, simp oversimplifying left-right political spectrum, could be a, become a big brother. And if you can't turn your head, if you can only look in one direction, that's a pity. Because your elites could 
be big brother. And the people accusing them may have a point. But the point is this. At another level, it doesn't matter. Because what are these teams? these people doing? They are selling fear. They are selling emotion. They're selling outrage. And what does it really boil down to? How many of you just chuckled? How many of you know what's coming? So, I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, yeah, all right, let's all do that. Let's all do that. At the count of three, one, two, three. I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. And those of you who don't know this cultural keystone to your culture, you're too young, look it up. It's from, <laughs> it's from the movie Network. And it epitomizes what is wrong with us boomers and why we were able to take on so many social causes because we're in, we are experts at dichotomies and, and playing the role of indignation. But I'm going to t step back for a second, and I'm going to talk about addiction. Addiction? What does this have to do with it? Heroin, uh, over-the-counter drugs, the latest addictions, which are electronic. <laughs> and then, of course, addictions that are bad for our health but had reasons in the past. Well. Let's talk a little bit about addiction. Addiction is rooted in positive things. We have a self-reinforcement system inside our brains that helps us to do arduous things that we must do repeatedly with vigor and persistence. It makes these things pleasurable. Like, for instance, maintaining a pair bond. We do that by falling in love. The most difficult task of all, raising another human being and not strangling them by the time they head off to college? That takes love, which translates into addiction. There are reinforcement systems in your brain, addiction to music, or to the love of nature, the love of God, or the love of getting out there and feeling alive, or the most powerful of all addictions in the ascent of man and woman across the last 100,000 years, and that is the skilled craftsman or craftswoman's Addiction to going back again and again to the relentless labor and disappointment and triumph of skill. It's a natural process with mat natural mechanisms that we're starting to figure out now with dopamine and serotonin and all the different ways in which our neurons flash. And it's a reinforcement system that we would not be human without and we would have no zest without it. But it is also hijacked, very easily hijacked. Some industries depend on it and spend billions every year in order to hook people on the pattern that makes them profit. And of course, we know that there are industries that do that in, through media as well. I gave a talk about this a couple of years ago at the National Institutes on Drug Addiction. So what does addiction have to do with indignation? It's very simple. How many of you have ever been indignant? Liars. How many of you have ever been indignant and actually had the guts and the courage and honesty to face a mirror and admit, this feels so good. I am so right, and they are so wrong. It's an addiction. And people will go to that addiction and they will find something that suits their personality and their peer group in order to get addicted to it, in order to do, exert the self-righteous fury. And this is why the most indignant and self-righteous people take over the advocacy groups at any end of the political spectrum. And am I saying that this is the root of all advocacy? No, I'm saying it's easy to get indignant about any cause, including indignation. And to feel so good that everybody's paying attention to you. Don't listen to people like that. Oh. <laughs> Whatever the merits of your cause, indignation draw, uh, robs from you the ability to better target your outrage, to negotiate with moderate opponents, to split your opposite coalition 
off the moderates and weaken their coalition by negotiating with moderate members of the other side, to prioritize getting half a loaf and then getting the rest later, or to build the cred just to know that, that people have people know that you're not a screaming idiot. The point is that there's a difference between confidence and arrogance, between criticism and cynical despair, and those who spread cynicism endlessly all the time. They're getting off on it. Arr! <laughs> Problems do get partly solved. It's a fact. Things are getting better in as many ways as they're getting worse. In fact, more ways than they're getting worse. And the question is, are we halfway? to the dream that is so seldom conveyed by science fiction, Star Trek. A society of nobility and honesty and decency. I contend we are halfway there. And here's the operative question. Why does that make you angry? And I know there are some of you out there who are fuming right now because I have said that things are getting better. Why? Well, the mo ingredient that's most under attack is confidence. Our belief in our ability that we could make artificial intelligence sane, that we could adapt to the new world in which we are going to be augmenting ourselves and our children, and do it with some wisdom, and do all the other things that are amazingly in our future, and possibly through reciprocal accountability and finding each other's delusional mistakes, actually negotiate the quicksand pits and make it to a better world. And so I want to lead you through one exercise and ask you this, and I'm going to be begging the organizers for a little more time to do this. I'm gonna show you a pure example of something that should have made you proud and happy without any reservation. And did you feel that way? We sent a spacecraft, you did this, you did this, all the way to Mars that passed through the Martian atmosphere and slowed down as if you had shot a bullet from here to New York City through a window. And it deployed a parachute that then deployed a rocket crane that lowered to the Martian surface a laboratory the size of an SUV that, was, that had parts from 40 different nations and whose name was voted on by the children of this planet and is now roaming the Martian surface as a laboratory on your behalf, named after the finest of all human qualities. You did this. How did you respond when it happened? With yawns? With timid satisfaction, maybe mentioning a little bit of happiness the next day with your friends. This should have caused you something just short of an orgasm. Seriously, <laughs> you did this. You did this, and it shows, that, I don't care if you don't care about space, it showed a level of competence that says we can do it. You, you name it, and we can do it. But have you ever seen a movie that says this other than Star Trek? Confidence is the rebel meme. Instead of all the dystopias that are cookie cutter over and over and over and over, each of them hammering and undermining our confidence and our ability to have a, a civilization and believe that our neighbors are anything other than sheep. Yes, issue dire warnings. Yes, get your blood up to fight injustice. But while you're at it, we can only solve problems if we believe we can. And so, at risk of hypocrisy, I'm going to ask you to do something here. Next time something unalloyedly cool happens, stop your indignant furies and try changing tracks just to see if you can. Celebrate our can-do ability to negotiate, to compromise, to innovate, compete, cooperate, and get things done. Celebrate that something good happened. So, and so this is your exercise. I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell. And what will you yell?
in order to get past this sales pitch of gloom, of anger, 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 all the time, the drug of anger. Yell what? I defy you to try this. I'm as proud as hell, and my civilization can solve anything, and we can. <laughs>